He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And we'll stop right there. You know, here Jesus uses this analogy of shepherding, right, to help us understand a little bit about himself. And shepherding is a number of elements, right? There's obviously sheep involved in shepherding. There's a shepherd, right? But then there's also what, what's called a sheepfold or, you know, this, this sheep pen where they keep the sheep. And there's, the pen has a gate on it. And then there's these, these dangerous things. There's, there's thieves, there's robbers, there's predators, right? And so Jesus is drawing upon all these elements of shepherding, which is a commonly understood, you know, career in Jesus' time and in, in, in that part of the world. To make some points, and you know, it's a, it can be a little bit confusing because I don't know if you if you read carefully, you go, well, I thought so. One second it sounds like he's the shepherd, but then in another moment it sounds like, well, he's actually the gate. Well, then who's the gatekeeper? Like it can be easy to kind of get confused and go, well, if Jesus is the gate, how is he also the shepherd? Like, don't get too caught up in trying to assign each element a person, right? It's like that when you're in elementary school and like one of your homework is like, match the words and you draw the line, right? Oh, this is that and this is that. Okay, it's not a totally linear analogy and that's okay. Jesus is just trying to tell us some things about himself. And so he shifts angles. He's like, hey, if I'm the shepherd, here's what this means for you. And if I'm the gate, here's what this means for you. Okay, so really that's the focus is really to see what is Jesus revealing to us about himself. And he says these things, I am the gate and I am the shepherd. And the shepherd is worth its whole own sermon. So we're going to do that next time together. But today we're going to talk about Jesus being the gate. I am the gate. You know, at the time of Jesus, right in the first century, uh, sheep were often kept in something called the sheepfold. And these were basically just low walls made of stone, maybe three or four feet high maximum just designed to keep the sheep contained. And um, they're sometimes attached to the side of a house, but if they're out in the wilderness or just kind of out in the middle of nowhere, they'd just be these, these enclosures. And some of them had a gate, you know, like a wooden gate, but some of them were just very rudimentary. They just had a kind of an opening in the wall. And you could see how in, in that scenario... What would happen is the shepherd would become the gate. The shepherd would literally lay down at night. They'd, they'd bring in all the sheep for the night after they've done grazing. They'd bring them in to keep them protected from, again, thieves and predators. And literally the shepherd would lay down, kind of like in that last photo, except that one. Imagine that doesn't have the wooden gate. They would lay down there as the literal gate of the sheep. And so in that sense, you can see how Jesus could be both shepherd and gate. But taking all that into account, what does this tell us about Jesus? Well, there's another one. Sometimes they would take advantage of, of just natural formations like caves and things and then kind of wall that in, right? But what does this tell us about Jesus? I think if we had to sum it up, we could say that the message here is Jesus only. Entrance through Jesus only. Fulfillment in Jesus only. And therefore make Jesus your one and only. Let's talk about that. Entrance through Jesus only. You know, back in verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Not a gate, not one of many ways. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Again, the sheepfold often only had one, not often, they only ever had one entrance. You don't want multiple exits for sheep just to go willy-nilly. Right? You, you have one entrance, one way in, one way out. Jesus says, I am the gate. The only way to be saved is to enter through Jesus. It's similar to another thing that Jesus says. We're going to look at this in a, in a few weeks. 
Spoiler alert, this is another one of Jesus' I am statements. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right, that's another one of those statements. And what Jesus is saying here, this is a claim of exclusivity. Christianity is one of the most inclusive religions of all time. God has a heart to reach all people, but there's an exclusive nature in that Jesus is the only way in. The idea that all roads lead to heaven. The idea that all religions basically worship the same God, right? Just pick the one that works for you, right? Those ideas are 100% completely false. They're not the same, not even close to the same. I've read the Quran. I had to for class. The God of, of Islam is so different. Allah is so different from the compassionate God of the Bible. I don't want to get into it, but he's wrathful, he's unproductive, he's just completely different. It's a completely different religion. Buddhism was originally an atheistic religion. Did you know that? Buddhism, original Buddhists believe that there is no, nothing is actually real. That's all an illusion. There, not even God is real. Nothing's real. It was originally an atheistic religion. It's not even close to Christianity. But let's talk about something even closer to home, shall we? How about the Mormons? You guys see that new temple they're building up on Horizon Drive? Okay. Um, you know, they seem to be pretty faithful people. I don't know if you have any Mormon friends or family, or I don't know, if you have a Mormon background. I'm not trying to be offensive here. Generally speaking, they're pretty high character people. If you know any Mormons, they're hard workers. Their families seem like they've got it all together. And they seem pretty faithful. They seem to have a lot of things on straight. And here's the kicker. If you ask them, they will say, oh, we're Christians too. That's what they'll say. Oh, we're also Christians. We also follow Jesus. They say they believe in Jesus and they follow Jesus, and so it might be easy to think, well, are we, are we really that different? Are we really all that different? A close look, though, at their beliefs reveals a very different Jesus. And I just want to educate you guys a little bit on this, because I think we live in, in an area that's, this is prominent, okay? We're right next door to Utah. You just need to know this stuff. They believe in a very different Jesus, Okay. This is a quote from Joseph Smith, who's their founding prophet. He was preaching this sermon. He says, God himself was once as we are now and is an, uh, and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. They believe that, that God was once just a flesh and bone you, just a human being. There's a quote straight out of their doctrines and covenants. That's one of their uh, other books outside the Bible. That should give you a red flag right there. But Doctrines and Covenants says the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. So that's what they believe. They believe that uh, God is a, was a human, that he kind of worked his way up to godness, to godhood, and exalted himself. And they have this belief that that's kind of how it all works. That's what they believe about Jesus. They believe that Jesus is the supposed spirit child of the Heavenly Father and the Heavenly Mother. Okay? They believe that Jesus is actually the brother of Satan and that Jesus was not God from the beginning, but that Jesus had to earn his way up to God, that Jesus actually earned the title of Messiah by proposing a better plan to save humans than, than Satan did. And he earned the title of Messiah and became a God, okay? So they don't believe that Jesus was always God. And you might go, well, why does that mean that matters? It's kind of religious, you know, whatever. Well, it matters a lot because if that's, their God, and that's who Jesus is to them, that is then the model of what you need to do. You need to earn your way and work your way up to God's status. And that's what they believe. Here's a, here's a direct quote from one of their teachers, Spencer Kimball. He's a, he's a big wig teacher in the Mormon church. He says, this progress towards eternal life is a matter of achieving perfection. Living all the commandments guarantees total forgiveness of sins and assures one of exaltation. It's very different than the grace of Jesus covers your sin, even on your worst day. This is, you've got to be perfect. You've got to follow perfectly and work your way up if you want to have any shot at heaven. Okay, so that's why Mormon families look like they've got it all together. Okay, because underneath is this simmering anxiety that I've got to be perfect. I've got to, I've got to earn it. And so I've got to work hard, and, I've got, and, and it does create outwardly a good look, but under that shiny exterior is a simmering anxiety that cannot rest until you've achieved perfection. 
And so at the end of the day, Mormonism falls right in with Hinduism, with Islam as another religion where you've got to work your way up to God. Christianity is the only religion where God comes down to us, meets us where we're at, loves us where we're at, saves us because we couldn't save ourselves. Don't be deceived. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. You can't earn your way to God. You can't be a good enough person. Not all roads lead to heaven. Jesus is the gate, and we must enter through him to be saved. But there's another piece to this. Because this word saved in the Greek is this word sozo. Sozo, which, if you look in your Bible, if, do you have a footnote in uh, verse, I think it's verse 9? It says, They'll enter through me and be saved. But what's the footnote say? Did you find it? Kept safe. safe. Yeah, I've heard heard it from a couple places. Be kept safe. And that's kind of what sozo is. Sozo, yes, it, it does mean to be saved like eternally. It does mean to have, you know, eternal, to get to heaven. But there's also this piece about salvation being healing, being healing from the scars you carry, right? It can be the true way into security. Jesus is saying, as the gate, I'm the only way you're ever going to have real security. I'm the only way to true healing for your wounds, right? It's more than just, I'm the only train to heaven. So get on board, right? It's, It's more than that. There's a real saving that happens in this life, here and now. And so let me ask you, right? Who do you trust or what do you trust for your security? Like, what makes you feel like everything is going to be all right? Money in the bank? Meat in the freezer? Guns in the closet? The right people in Washington? The right clothes in your dresser? What is it? What makes you feel like, I'm good, I'm safe, I'm secure, I fit in? Where do you get your security? You know, Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Right? Looking for security outside of God is in vain. Right? Because all those things I just named will eventually fail. Your bank account could fail. Your gun can fail. Your politicians definitely fail. Right? Clothes are not hip in about two weeks. You know what I mean? Like, we can't put our security, our hope in things outside of Jesus. These things aren't inherently evil or bad. Okay, I'm not saying that, but Jesus has to be our, our source of security, of healing for those wounds that we carry. You know, it's interesting. You guys remember when Wade was here and he preached on Mark 5 and about that woman, the bleeding woman? And we talked about how, you know, she's crawling and she's trying to touch. She's like, if I just touch the hem of his robe, I'll be healed. That's the word sozo. If I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. The same word as, as, as the word here for saved. Right? She says she's made well, she's made whole. And I think salvation is so much more than I got my ticket to heaven, I'm good. It's Jesus wants to make you whole in every respect. And so only Jesus will never fail. He's the gate. He is our security. He's he's our hope that's going to be okay. And even if we do suffer in the body, he's going to shepherd our souls to safety. Amen? Amen. So that's the first thing. Secondly is fulfillment in Jesus only. Again, in verse 9 here, if you look at the second part of this verse, he says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And again, it can be easy to kind of get confused here if you're trying to make this a big linear analogy. Because you go, wait, I thought we were supposed to get in. So now what's this about going in and coming out? What? I don't understand. Don't get hung up on that. I think what Jesus is saying here is, yes, that you need to get in through him. And he's the only way in. But once you're in, once you're under the protection and care of the shepherd, we get to enjoy this, this life of, of freedom. We get to go in and come out and enjoy this abundant life under the care of our shepherd. I'll show you what I mean. So this phrase, come in and go out, is actually a bit of an echo to some of the Old Testament covenant language. In the Old Testament, for instance, in Deuteronomy, 
Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law, and Moses is laying out the laws, and he kind of gets to the conclusion, kind of laid them all out, and there's this part where he basically lays down, he's like, look, I want you to follow, because here's the blessings if you follow, and here's the curses if you don't, okay? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. We're grateful for the grace of Jesus, amen? But this is Old Testament, and this is how it worked. And he said, uh, there's this list of blessings in chapter 28, I just want to read this here to you. He says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God, you will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. And it just goes on. Just blessing, blessing, blessing. Blessed when you go in and blessed when you come out. When you go out. And so it's just this picture of like, when you're coming and going, like whatever you're doing, as you're going about your life, that it's this life of abundance, this life of blessing. And this is why, is when we look back in John, the very next verse is this famous verse, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. All right, so do you guys see the connection? Sometimes that, that verse 10, we will quote it. It's a beautiful verse. Jesus wants to have this, uh, have this abundant life. But it's not just this isolated verse. It's directly connected to Jesus being the gate. Entering into your relationship with Jesus is the way to the most full, fulfilling, satisfying life possible. That's what we're getting at. Entering into a relationship with Christ is the way to the most full, fulfilling, and satisfying life possible. This is not the prosperity gospel. We're not saying just follow Jesus and you'll get rich and you'll never suffer and you'll, everything will be great. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is Jesus gives us life to the full. Because we know, right, some of the most fulfilling things in life come through suffering. Ask any parent in the room, right? Some of the most fulfilling things in life, the most joyful, awesome things in life... There's suffering involved. So Jesus is not saying, follow me and you'll, let, you'll never have a hard day in your life. He's saying the most full, fulfilling, rich life is a life with Jesus. You know, this helps, I think, with people who might struggle with FOMO. Who knows what FOMO stands for? Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Because, right, some people think, well, if I follow Jesus, that means I can't do Fill in the blank, right? This, that, the other thing. If I follow Jesus, then I'm going to miss out upon these things my friends are doing or whatever it is. Or people think the Bible is simply a list of rules that you have to follow. Rules that ultimately are restrictive, that keep us shackled, keep us from doing what we really want to do. But here's the thing. Like if God is our designer, right? If God is the inventor of human beings, he knows what makes us run well. You know, we just went to visit my mom last week, and my mom lets us borrow her car. And, uh, you know, we're, we're driving it around, so it's getting low on gas. We're thinking, I, you know, rather than rent a car, love that my mom gave us a car, but we should fill up the tank. So I call her, Mom, what, what kind of gas does your car take? Oh, it takes premium. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you know, I'm grateful. You know, I'm paying less than I would on a rental car. But, you know, I'm used to driving up to the gas station, and whatever number they display, you're like, that's the gas number. Because it's always, like, the lowest one, right? But, and so it's always like this shock when you like, you go up to medium. Does anyone get medium? I don't know. And then like you go up to premium and it's like, oh my gosh, five bucks a gallon. You know, it's just, it's, it's hurts. It's a little costly. You're like, oh, okay. But you know, it's for that car. That's what it's designed to run on. It runs, it runs its best on premium. And I think as your designer, God knows what makes you run at your fullest potential. Following him is costly. It's going to cost you something to follow Jesus. You're going to have to give up some things. But to live as we were designed, to live as God intended, 
is more than worth the cost. It's the greatest joy. It is life to the full. I want to share this quote with you. I, I read this, well, I thought it was just an excellent article on this passage. Um, she says, this is uh, an Episcopalian actually. I really liked what she had to say. She said, needless to say, most of us left to ourselves don't associate gates with freedom. That's true, right? You have a gate, you don't think freedom, you think enclosure, right? That's what she says. We imagine toddler gates, which don't work, maybe, or, or puppy training gates, right? Prison gates and gated communities. But what if Jesus is a different kind of gate? A gate that opens out instead of closing in. Not the barrier itself, but the aperture in it. A place of release, movement, spaciousness, liberty. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I just love that. Like, when we think of Jesus, don't think of him as a barrier. Think of him as the, the point of freedom. The point through which you enter into freedom and fulfillment. Right? It's not Jesus that restricts our life. It's sin that keeps us chained and shackled. Jesus seeks to set us free. And so if we're going to fear missing out on something, it ought to be the fear of missing out on the life that God has in store for us. I don't know about you, I don't want to get to the end of my life and have missed out on what God's plan was. Because I know that God has an incredible plan, the best plan for our lives. As the gate to freedom, true fulfillment is found in Jesus only. And finally, if that's true, make Jesus your one and only. If entrance to salvation is in Jesus only, and if true fulfillment is in Jesus only, then it naturally follows, make Jesus your one and only. Your top priority. Right? The one that you seek after the most. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus tells this story about the door. And it's important to know that the Greek word for door and gate are the same. So depending on what translation you are reading, when we read Jesus saying, I'm the gate, some translations he says, I'm the door. It's the same word in, uh, in the original language. Luke 13, verse 22, it says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me. All you evildoers. I can't whistle, but I, I would if I could right there. Yeah, that's a sobering passage. And it starts with a question. You notice that in verse 23, right? He says, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus does answer the question. He essentially says, yeah. But he doesn't just say, yeah. He says, and here's why. Here's why that's going to be the case. He says, there's going to be a lot of people on Judgment Day who stand before God and who thought they were going to be saved. And they won't be. That is a sobering thought. Do you think you're saved? They'll be the kind of people who go, Jesus... We ate, and, we ate and drank with you. We shared meals. We, we heard you teach in our streets. We hung out where you hung out. We were around your people. We listened to what you had to say. We listened to your teachings. Heard a lot of podcasts about you, Jesus. Went on some mission trips for you, Jesus. But Jesus will say, I never knew you. Because you can be religious. You can hang out where Jesus and his people hang out. You can listen to his teachings. You can come to church every week. You can be part of a small group. You can do all the religious stuff and still not be saved. Why? Well, Jesus says, you don't know me. Well, actually, what he says is, I don't know you. That's what he says. I never knew you. And you go, well, wait a minute. 
how could Jesus, I mean, isn't he God, right? How could Jesus not know who I am? Didn't he make me? Didn't God, didn't God make everybody? Like, how could he not know who I am? And of course, if you've been around our church for a little while, you know where I'm going with this. This is the uh, Glenn's Yada theology that we talk about sometimes. This idea that to know is more than just not intellectual knowledge, right? We, to know in the Greek is gnosko, and the Hebrew is this word yada. They both communicate not just knowing in your head, but experience, right? To know about skydiving and to, and to have gone skydiving are, are different ways to know about skydiving, right? You know what I'm saying? If someone's been skydiving and you go, hey, do you know about, have you ever, do you know about what skydiving is? They go, oh yeah. And they, can, they, they immediately come to mind these feelings of, you know, the, the anxiety on the plane, the, whoa, the, the joy, the exhilaration, right? It's, it's an experience versus just reading about it or watching a video of it, right? There's a difference between knowing intellectually and experiential, experiential knowledge, and Jesus wants the latter. Jesus wants to experience our hearts because I think a lot of people experience his heart towards them. Plenty of people, plenty of religious people, you know, will have some experience of God. Maybe it's in some epic worship service or maybe it's at some conference or maybe it's at some camp under the stars and there's some epic thing that happens and they feel something. And that's valid. That's a valid experience to experience God in some way. But it's not enough just for you to experience God. He needs to experience you. Because any healthy relationship is a two-way street. But I think what happens is people equate the feeling to salvation. They go, oh, I felt something. I had an experience. And they go, well, I must be saved then. But it's not about that. It's about does Jesus also experience our hearts? Do we communicate our hearts back to him the way he's communicated his heart to us? We look at the cross, we look at how Jesus gave his life on the cross and the, what he was willing to endure for us, right? And you go, he's communicating his heart. He's, he's putting himself out there, so vulnerable. And just it's like, look how much I love you, right? He's communicated his heart to us, but do we communicate our heart back to him? Does Jesus know you? What would he say? You know, how does that happen? How do we communicate our heart toward, toward Jesus? There's a lot of things here, right? I think faith, obedience to his commands, repentance, like when we choose to, we're walking away from him, and we choose to about face and turn, and, and, and that communicates our hearts to him, and repentance, you know, choosing to be baptized where your sins are washed away, and it reconciles the relationship, all the hurt, all the grudges between you and God are washed away. There's a lot of things to it. This isn't salvation by works, but there are things we can do for Jesus to experience our hearts. And if you want to know more about that or dive deeper, consider asking about sitting down and doing a personal Bible study with one of our members. Like, it's important to study this out for yourself. But I would just say there's no more important use of your time. Jesus says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Jesus must be our one and only. He must be our one and only. Is Jesus your top priority? I'm just going to end with a few questions to consider. Is Jesus your top priority? Is knowing him and being known by him your deepest desire? Do you want Jesus or just what he can do for you? Have you entered through the narrow door? Or will you be one of those who is surprised to be locked out when the last day comes? And for those of you who are truly his disciples, is Jesus still your one and only? Does he get the best of your heart? Or does he get the leftovers? Does he get the best of your time or does he get the scraps? Those few minutes at the end of the day when everything else has gotten the best of you and you've got just some crumbs to give, does Jesus get the scraps? Or does he get the best of your heart? Are your actions communicating to him that he is the most important person in your life? And if not, what changes can you make? What adjustments can you make this week to show Jesus, Jesus, you are my one and only? And I don't want to just say it. I don't want to just sing it at church. I want to show you. You're my one and only. 
Jesus says, I am the gate. That means entrance through Jesus only. Fulfillment in Jesus only. And it means let's make Jesus our one and only. Amen? Amen. We'll go ahead and pray for our time of communion, and then we'll take that here together.